present. Jeff Bromley will present uh, church members here that are lawyers, and they will be presenting some about some of the current cases that we have in religious liberty. For instance, school prayer, um, some of the funding issues for parochial schools and uh, religious schools, and some of those issues we'll be looking at week by week. Some of them will be panel discussions. On all of these, we will have question and answer session at the end of the, end, the, end of the time, just to discuss. Uh, and I want to paint a little bit of a picture of why we chose this topic. So I hope, uh, if you're tuning in, that you are interested in religious liberty. Um, we're going to be in for a treat. This church, it's one of the privileges we have of being uh, members here at Markham Woods. If you're not a member here uh, and don't know our, who are our church members here, we are very fortunate. We have many lawyers and people that are interested in promoting religious liberty and, and can deal with these topics in a thorough and um, comprehensive way that will help us understand some of the issues of religious liberty uh, that are going on. So before we begin tonight, we're going to be looking at religious liberty in world history. Um, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for liberty, the, your promise in your word, that wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here with us as we look at history and we pray that you will uh, guide and direct each of our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So first of all, I am going to start with why I am doing this first presentation and why I have a personal burden for this topic. September 1, 2001, I started working in the Republic of Georgia. It's a former Soviet satellite state. It's right in between Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, right there in the Caucasus region, in between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And they have had war after war. The Turks have come through, the Mongols have come through, uh, Attila the Hun, uh, the Russians, uh, the Persians. They've had ever, the Arabs, even after the um, Arabs came into power. So they've had, this region has been overrun mul multitude of times. Georgia is the second oldest Christian country in the world. The first oldest, the, I'm the first oldest, the oldest Christian country in the world is right next door. It's Armenia. Uh, they accept, Armenia accepted Christianity in 301 AD, and Georgia accepted Christianity in 337 AD. So they've been Christian for 1,700 years. So when I moved there, our church had very few members, about 350 members that is all, out of a population of about six million people. I'd been going there on, on short-term mission trips, but I moved there in, in September of 2001, and we moved to the city of Tbilisi. I have a picture of it there in the bottom right corner. It's a gorgeous city, be one of the most beautiful cities in the world probably. Uh, a lot of very interesting architecture, and it's right on a river tucked in the mountains there of Georgia. But this gentleman um, on the left side of that screen, is we called him Mama, because Mama in Georgian means dad <laughs> or Papa, Mama Bas Basili, Bas no, Mama Basili. He was a defrocked uh, Orthodox priest who was a very nationalistic uh, Georgian, and he took it upon himself to attack all the sectant groups, they call them, that were living in Georgia. There were 82 instances of where he led basically hoodlums to religious gatherings, and the police would completely turn a blind eye, and they would drag people out of these meetings and beat them up right in the street. Some of them had irreversible brain damage, eye damage. I don't think anybody died. Uh, and the Georgian government did nothing to it. And you know why? Because... Everybody there thought that the Georgian church had saved Georgia for 1,700 years. And who are these new religious groups to come and ruin our country, ruin our not respect our history, and, and basically doom, doom our country not even to be a country anymore? Georgia is for Georgian Orthodox people. So everybody got lumped in this group together, and we were part of that. Seventh-day Adventists, there were Mormons, there were Jehovah's Witnesses, there were Pentecostals, different Baptist groups. Uh, all kinds of uh, religious groups were working there, and, and the government just didn't care. 
On paper, we had religious freedom, but in reality, we did not have religious freedom. Every time we went to church, we had to look out and see if, if there were groups of like bandits coming to drag us out of church. Unfortunately, we were so small, they didn't care about us. Other groups that were larger, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they had up to 20,000 members, and they were very aggressive, and I don't, I'm not blaming the Jehovah's Witnesses. I actually admired their, their missionary zeal. They went door to door and did all this evangelistic work, and they got beat up on, a, I think, out of the 82 instances, if I remember right, 78 of them were actually uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that got beat up. It, it all changed in about 2003 when my friend, who was a, I think he was some type of Pentecostal missionary, uh, Assemblies of God, actually, missionary there in Georgia, and he and about seven other missionaries went to a plot of land there near Tbilisi where they were going to build a seminary uh, to train pastors for their church, Georgian pastors, national, national pastors. Well, Mama Basili didn't realize that they were all Americans, and he brought two busloads of these hooligans that came and beat them up. They beat them to, I mean, they stole their cameras, they, they all had bruises, they all had like sticks, and they, and they just beat these guys up. Uh, not so bad that they died, uh, but just to intimidate them. Well, it turns out, if you remember, George Bush uh, was president at that time, and his... Um, Attorney General was John Ashcroft, whose father was a prominent minister in the Assemblies of God. So they actually made a call to the U.S. government and said, listen, the Assemblies of God just got really beat up, and they're not going to allow them to build a seminary there. So George Bush somehow got on the phone with Edward Shevardnadze, he was the president of Georgia, and said, listen, you need to protect the religious minorities, otherwise we'll cut off all the funding that the U.S. government is giving to the Republic of Georgia. So overnight, we had religious freedom, and everything changed. But it took a, a terrible incident, like actually 80-some incidents like that, for it to change. In the mentality, the people didn't change. That's a Christian country. Uh, Armenia wasn't quite as bad, um, but again, since they were the oldest Christian country, their attitude was, why are you here? Why did you come to ruin our country? We've been Christian for 1,700 years. When has the Seventh-day Adventist church been uh, created? 1840s, 1860s? That's just a baby church. We, we were Christian, you know, for 1,600 years before you guys, and it saved our country from all these different attacks, from the Muslims, from the Mongols, from the Tatars. Uh, you know, who are you guys? So religious freedom was a, a really an uphill battle. We always had a hard time renting buildings, uh, we had a hard time publishing literature if we sent out literature evangelists. Uh, anytime we did business, uh, for instance, the church over there, and I don't want to share too many secrets, but I don't think this is a secret. Our church in that whole part of the world does not own any property. We, buy, we had to buy property through local church members and put it in their name. We had no bank accounts. We used personal bank accounts. We all had to, I was a treasurer. We opened up personal bank accounts and we would transfer money from the General Conference and the EuroAsian Division through personal bank accounts because the church couldn't own a bank account. Because it was so uh, dangerous, the government would know how much money was coming in and then the government would be tempted to either try to take it or shut us down. In fact, when I was in Armenia, uh, they went from, you had to have a certain amount of people registered in the country to be a religious entity. And it was, it, the level was 50, and they wanted to raise it to 500. Well, that almost would have put us out of business. We couldn't have been registered because we didn't think we could find 500 of our 900-some members that would be willing to, to go before the government and put their name on a piece of paper saying that they were Seventh-day Adventists. I got called into the U.S. Embassy. Uh, I was the president of the Armenian Mission, so I went, and they do a religious freedom report every year, and they wanted to interview me, so I went in and talked to the guy that was creating the report for Armenia there in the U.S. Embassy, and uh, yeah, we, I was just telling him some of the problems we had with registration and sending our missionaries to different towns and how the local priest would would, you know, try to intimidate or they would try to, to rally the authorities against us. 
And he just looked at me and said, you know how many people it takes in America to register a, a religious entity? And I said, you know, I never even thought of that. How many? He's like, one. <laughs> you need one person in America to have a church or any type of religious entity. And in Armenia, they wanted to have 500. So the priests, the Christian priests, were, they were not friendly at all. My neighbor was a, a, a Georgian Orthodox priest when we were living in Georgia, and he came down to my house one night, and he sat in my kitchen, and he, was, he had another guy going through the prayer beads, and they were exercising our house, getting the demons to leave because we were demon-possessed, and we were coming to, to ruin their country. And he told me he was going to fight against me with everything he had to, to keep me from destroying their country. I reminded him about Mama, Bas Mama Basili and what had happened with the U.S. government. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 spiritually I'm talking. I won't beat you up. So I was like, okay, just checking, just checking. Uh, then, you know, for, for a few years, I, off and on, I was working in the Islamic world. In fact, Azerbaijan was also a country that I worked in, and then we ended up moving there, lived there for one year, and then we moved to the Middle Eastern Union, which was actually at that time headquartered on Cyprus, because that's a Greek Orthodox, basically, country. It's a divided island, and half the island is Turkish, so it's Islamic, half the island is Greek Orthodox, and we were in the Greek Orthodox section of the island. But going around the Middle East, again, there are religious freedom issues, and we encountered it all the time. In Azerbaijan, when I lived there, this is Baku, uh, the, the city at the far, the upper right corner. Uh, absolutely beautiful city. If you ever want to travel to go see a, a nice Islamic city right on the Caspian Sea. Um, but again, they gave us some religious freedom. We would go to visit the government officials, and they were much kinder than the Christian officials in Georgia and Armenia for some reason. They would have us in, and we would sit there and drink tea, but they kept an eye on us all the time. And so if we wanted to print a book like Desire of Ages, we had to translate that whole book into Azeri from Russian or English, and then we had to take it to the government. We had to present it to them. They had to read through the whole thing. It would take months for them to have people read it, and then they would, they would decide how many books we could print. And, and published there in our, in our uh, printing house. Um, so there was some religious freedom, uh, but they kept a very close eye on us. Every time we preached, there was a law in Azerbaijan that no foreigner could preach. And we had a problem because all of our Adventist pastors, we only had one or two Adventist pastors that had been born in Azerbaijan. All of them were from Moldova, and they were a, a group of people called Gagaus who were uh, leftover Turks from the Ottoman Empire that were left in Moldova. And there was one church there in Moldova that had 900 members. It was almost the size of Markham Woods in a village of 3,000 people. And 30 pastors had come from that one church. It was this vibrant church. Almost a whole village had converted to Adventism. And so there were 30 pastors, and we took all these Gagaus, and we brought them over to Azerbaijan. But none of them were Azeri. They, their language was similar, so they could learn Azeri very quickly. Uh, but it was actually illegal for them to preach. Every time I got up to preach in Azerbaijan, it was an illegal act. And we had to be careful. And so we would have guys at the back doors, and they would tell me, okay, we think that guy's from the government. Just take it easy or, or whatever. They would counsel me on, on how much I could say or not say. Um, but again... We lived with, the, this was just the way we had to think, and all the time, whether you're buying a church property, preaching a sermon, trying to rent a building to do a, a series or a seminar, we always had to think about it. Then in the Middle East Union, uh, went to Egypt and Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt is, um, there are Christian churches, Coptic churches, about 10 million out of the 80 million people of Egypt are Christians, but they're Coptic Christians. And oddly enough, for Seventh-day Adventists, the Coptic Christians were more hostile to us than the Muslims because they viewed us as traitors and, and somewhat almost becoming Islamicized and that we don't drink alcohol and don't eat pork and we're kind of legalistic like, like the Muslims. So our, our church president there, he, one of the secret, not secret service, it was um, like the... Uh, FBI agents of Egypt, it's, they don't call it FBI, but he came to him and he said, listen, your, your worst enemies on this council that are looking over religious affairs here in Egypt are the Christians and not the Muslims. They're going to be, they're much more hostile to you and they'll try to 
pull the rug out from you uh, for documents or, or, or doing anything. So, and, but the Muslims, again, had to keep an eye on all the Christian groups, and there was some freedom because you had, you know, about 12% of the population that was Christian, so you couldn't get rid of them all, chase them out or kill them or anything, although there were acts of violence. If you watch news, there are acts of violence between uh, the Muslims and Christians, um, and historically there has been in Egypt. Picture on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was a country we knew we had to work there, but none of us in the office, here we are, this is our church territory, and none of us had ever been there, couldn't go there. Christians can't go to Saudi Arabia unless you're invited by the government, you're doing something for the government. Uh, one of our friends had been over there, and she went on a 2,500 mile trip with her brother. And there was a car following her the whole time watching her just to make sure everything was proper, nothing was out of place. Um, all the websites are, you know, if you're trying to get a Christian website into these countries, they're, they're, they're tracked. Uh, the government is watching what you're doing as far as, you know, what you're trying to propagate as far as matters of faith. And... Um, you know, there are Christians in Saudi Arabia. We knew we had about probably 300 Adventists in Saudi Arabia. Uh, most of them were probably from Asia, Pakistan, the uh, Philippines. Uh, they were working there. And they actually had a camp meeting there on the beach, there on the Red Sea, or the Persian Gulf. Um, some sheikh had, had liked them and gave them this thing. But again, it was all kind of under the table. We just heard about it. None of us could go there to see them. None of us as church administrators could actually go and spend time with them. So I tell you all of this because for a good portion of my life, we, I was overseas eight years, and then I, I would go back from time to time, went back to Dubai, did some meetings, went to Iraq on a humanitarian mission. And all the time you're having to think about religious freedom. It just hangs over you. And it hangs over the church. And I've seen what it does to the church. When you don't have that freedom, and you have to think about it just at a, on a constant basis almost. Everything you do is being watched, is being monitored. When I would pick up the phone in Georgia, I would call. We had kind of the old landlines back then, and, um, yeah, and even the cell phones, but you would call landlines. And you would hear another click about three, four seconds into the phone call. And you would know that the KGB or the Georgian uh, you know, equivalent of the KGB was listening uh, to what you were doing and saying. So this is a burden of mine. And what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to go through, because I, if anything, I want to leave you with the thought tonight that sometimes, you know, even as I've been promoting this and talking to other people about it, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is old news, you know, yeah, religious freedom, oh, okay, whatever here in America. Religious freedom, and if you remember this, religious freedom is a mountain to climb and not a valley to descend into. Religious freedom is a mountain to climb and not a valley to coast into. The vast majority of humans that have lived on this planet have had not complete religious freedom. The vast majority. We are in the very small minority of people in history that actually have the privilege of being proud of who we are and being proud of celebrating pluralism and diversity of religious thought in our country and in this part of the world. The vast majority of people from the beginning of human history has, have not had this opportunity. And the Seventh-day Adventist, one of the things we see, and that's why we went through Daniel and Revelation in our, our last Wednesday night series, one of the things that is so key for us when we look at prophecy is that we see there will be a reversion. We go backwards in human history to the way we were doing things five, six hundred years ago. So I want us, as we go through these series of eight meetings, I want us to be convicted religious freedom proponents. And religious, being a religious freedom proponent means that we don't just root for Seventh-day Adventists. We root for other Christian denominations. We'll go to bat for them. We go to bat for other world religions, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims. 
and we fight for their rights, knowing what we have to go through in different parts of the world. And that's why I share for you know, eight years of my life what I had to go through. I was a religious minority everywhere I went. I am very sensitive to people in this country that are religious minorities, that is non-Christians. The Christian religion is a majority religion here. And if there is no religious freedom, because the Orthodox people and and the Muslim people in this country said, well, we need religious freedom too. And we need to be protected from all these terrible Protestant sects that are coming over. It's like, that's that's not the freedom. The freedom is that anybody can believe what they want to believe and can try to convince you to change your religion. That's the freedom. We believe that God has endowed each person with a human conscience and that we can freely express our beliefs and that we can actually have even religious debates and live in peace and harmony even with people that we disagree with religiously. So let's let's get into that. Hopefully that's, that's... I won't usually go on a little diatribe like that before we start, but I just, since this is our first meeting... That's why I'm, I'm convicted on this topic and believe that it's, it's pertinent to us, even though it may not seem that it is. I hope that you are watching, or if you're here in the auditorium tonight, that we will become enlightened in, in religious liberty issues to, to help our country and to help our church. Jeremiah 2. If you go back in the Bible, the, it, I think this is always an interesting statement by God. He a, actually asks a question, has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. So really there's only one God, but all these other nations had these false gods and they were worshiping, they had idols. And then he said to their Jews, but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. I want to concentrate on the first part of that. Has a nation ever changed its gods? That's an interesting question. It makes it sound like people changing a religion is a very rare thing. Most of us grow up in the faith that we're handed down and we just kind of follow it. Even if we don't really believe it, we can just be kind kind of cultural. I saw this in every country I went to. Muslims that really don't know the Quran. Christians in Armenia and Georgia that didn't know the elementary stories of the Bible, but yet they they were diehard Christians. I had one guy tell me, babies in the womb of their mother in this country are Christians before they, they are even born. And yet, you know, the baby doesn't even know anything. And then part of their, by the way, then that was Armenia, part of Armenians actually became Muslims that were living in Turkey and you can't talk about them in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. They are persona non grata. No one wants to have anything to do with them. How can an Armenian be a Muslim? That's just like, what? That's like being a Seventh-day Adventist Satanist. How, how do you combine that? Anyway, so we see that most people are just go with a collective. You stay in your family group, your nation, and whatever that is, you just follow that. And if we look in history, the choice of following a God was a matter more of nations than individuals. It's more, and we'll see that as we go through this. Now, Cyrus, he was an interesting guy. And that's why the Bible talks about him, because he allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. 539, he issued his reforms after conquering Babylon. And he was apparently a, a, a fairly enlightened individual, and he was very respectful of the gods of Babylon and of other nations. And this is why even the Bible talks about him helping the Jews go back and rebuild their temple. And uh, is there a bottle of water somewhere, maybe in the kitchen? Or <clears throat> I think I got something down the wrong pipe. But Cyrus the Great, and this is his Cyrus, uh, it was founded, I believe, 1879. Uh, some British, they were doing uh, excavation or um, archaeological dig, and they, they found this of where they actually see. He condemned Nabonidus, the, the ruler of Babylon at the time, but he was respectful of their gods. And we can see that the Persian Empire uh, did well when they respected the gods of the other nations. As the Greeks came along, they started to tinker with the idea of religious freedom. 
Uh, Aristotle agrees, though with disapproval, that according to the democratic conception, freedom and equality consist in everyone's doing what they please so that everyone may live as he likes. Now, this went against the grain, and this is why he actually disapproved of it. Um, and, you know, most people viewed, hey, you need to do what the nation is doing. You need to worship the gods the nation is worshiping, and if you don't, you know, somehow you're going to destroy the fabric of the society. Aristotle started to tinker with this idea that, hey, if we're going to have freedom, you have to allow people to choose what they're going to do, not just in religion, but in, in other things as well. Uh, Thucydides, in his history of the Peloponnesian War, has the Athenian statesman Pericles declare the freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from exercising a jealous surveillance over each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbor for doing what he likes. So in Athens, they started to try this. How, how do you allow people that freedom to live as, as, they, you know, as they want? What, what's the limit? What's the limit there? And so they started to wrestle with these uh, ideas. But... Uh, and, and really, for antiquity, it was implemented to an, exp an, uh, an impressive extent. The Romans came along, and uh, they, they, like the Greeks, were polytheistic, and they believed that doing the rituals to their gods would ensure national prosperity. Julius Caesar, actually before he became Caesar, he was actually the head of the main um, cult of deity there in Rome. And he was very religious, although, as the, the biographer that I was reading of him said, he, he really wasn't spiritual, but he was religious. He really didn't particularly believe in the gods, but the Romans had it so much in their minds that if you do the rituals, and there are these deities out there, and you do the right thing, then you will be blessed when you go off to war, and the Roman Empire will be blessed. So they were fine... Uh, with other polytheistic religions. Because if you're a polytheist and you become part of the Roman... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you became a Roman and, uh, or part of the Roman Empire and you were a polytheist, it was very easy. You would just accept the new, the new gods of the Romans as well as yours and you just had, instead of 10 gods, you had 24 or whatever. Now, Judaism and Christianity challenged this toleration because they were monotheistic. Yeah, excuse me. And so the Romans had a hard time with this, but Judaism had a rich history in the, in the uh, Roman Empire. And so they, they view them as a historical uh, portion of their empire. And the Jews had a reputation for being very seditious. So they didn't want to tick them off. <laughs> So they were, they were okay with leaving the Jews, being monotheistic, but we'll just keep a, uh, an eye on you, Pilate, uh, who was the one that decreed upon Christ to kill him. He was um, a very powerful person in the Roman Empire, and he was sent to, to Jerusalem because the Jews had this reputation, and they were very seditious, so take, keep an eye on them, but let them kind of do their thing with their religion. Christianity comes along, and they say, hey, we're a continuation of, of uh, Judaism. And if you're listening to the Romans uh, sermon I just gave, you see that Paul is very, the apostle Paul, that is, is very clear that he believes that Christianity is a fulfillment of Judaism. It's a continuation of it. The Jews were saying, no, it's not. It's a new religion. It's something new. It's not what we teach. It's not what we believe. And that's why they were trying to outlaw it. In the, in the and Tiberius, who was the emperor at the time of Christ, actually did call Christianity an illegal sect. But he told all the Roman rulers, he said, it's illegal, but just don't do anything with them. Just kind of let them be. Just, it was enough to shame them and just say that it's illegal and then it's in their minds, which I can relate to because that's much of what happened overseas when I was there. We really didn't have a ton of persecution against us, but there was always a threat of it. And so it just hangs over you like a, a black cloud. And so that's what they tried to do uh, with Christianity in the, in the Roman Empire. And from time to time, uh, for instance, when Nero, right at the time of Paul, when his, he was writing the book of Romans, when the city burned, 
uh, he scapegoated the Christians, and it was easy for people to be, oh, well, it's an illegal sect, yeah, so they were okay with thousands of them being killed, and you could see about every 60 to 80 years, there was kind of this persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. They weren't persecuted all the time. They would have long periods of peace, uh, but there was always that threat, just that black cloud of, of intolerance hanging over. So Christianity started off, here's Tertullian, he was a lawyer from, um, and those are the years he lived, right, as the Christian church kind of had experienced its glorious age of expansion, and now it's kind of settling down. And he says, it is a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to which free will and not force should lead us. This is interesting. This is an early Christian lawyer saying, listen, it's pretty clear that force isn't going to help the church. This isn't going to help move the church. We should, have, we should give religious freedom to people. Lactantius, a little bit after Tertullian, argued that religious beliefs cannot be meritorious unless they are accepted freely. And this would be a theme that would reverberate for many centuries in the arguments for toleration. So at the beginning, the Christians were first and foremost. It's always easier when you're a religious minority to argue for religious freedom than when you're in the majority. You rarely find somebody in the majority arguing for religious freedom. But when you're in the minority, you understand that hey, everybody needs to have, be free. And this is what he says, if you wish to defend religion by bloodshed and by tortures and by guilt, it will no longer be defended, but will be polluted and profaned. For nothing in so much a matter of free will as religion in which if the mind of the worshiper is disinclined to it, religion is at once taken away and ceases to exist. Isn't that interesting? If you take a, it's a, it's a great argument. If you take freedom away from religion, it ceases to be religion. It's just something you have to do, and it's not really a service of love or of conviction or of truth. It's just of, of convenience, which is interesting when you look at Revelation 13, worshiping with the mark of the beast on the forehead or just on the hand, convenience. So after Constantine... All of a sudden, Christianity wins. And it looks like it's a great thing. You go from being a persecuted religion to all of a sudden Constantine, the Roman emperor, says, whoa, hey, you're the government religion. Here's a Catholic historian, uh, Lord Acton. This is how he put it. Christianity, which in earlier times had addressed itself to the masses and relied on the principle of liberty, now made its appeal to the rulers and threw its mighty influence into the scale of authority. So Christianity, it's, it's interesting. Here's a Catholic theologian that says, and historian that says, wait a minute, you can see the shift in Christianity. All of a sudden, it, it's taken away from the masses of what it's designed for, of offering people freedom, freedom in Christ, and a hope for a future, to all of a sudden now it's, it's geared to the authority and the government, and it's it's designed to create laws and to, to basically force, force people into it. So we can see a shift. And it's very interesting, as I was thinking about it, you know, preparing for this, how Christianity, a religion of freedom, ended up becoming one of the worst oppressive powers that the world has known. Worse than the Greeks or the Romans. The Romans weren't always oppressive. So... In setting for this presentation, the name that kept popping up in Christian circles is St. Augustine. And look at when he lived, 354 to 430 AD. This is right during that shift of when Christianity all of a sudden went from being a, an underground religion to being a, basically the preferred government religion. Here, Augustine presented the interesting hypothetical of a house, this is how he described it, which we know with absolute certainty is about to collapse and kill everyone inside. If the inhabitants ignore our repeated warnings to get out, then what should we do? So you, you get the picture, right? This house is burning. You know it's going to collapse. You know they're going to die. What do you do? Should we rescue them against their wills and then reason with them afterwards? He said yes. I think that if we abstain from doing it, we should well deserve the charge of cruelty. He started to go against the principle of freedom. He said it would be better for them. They don't know it. 
We'll reason with them afterwards, but we'll compel them to do the right thing because that house is going to, we're going to compel them to get out. And by the way, he used Luke 14 where, where the, you know, they remember the, the parable of the feast and the people wouldn't come. And so the master of the banquet says, go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in. He said, see, the Bible actually enjoins us to do this. Then he says this, but suppose that as we undertake our forcible rescue, all occupants except one kill themselves by leaping out of a high window. Should we blame ourselves for those deaths? <laughs> no, said Augustine. We should console ourselves in our grief for the loss of the rest by the thoughts of the one who was rescued, and we should not allow all to perish without a single rescue in the fear, lest the remainder should destroy themselves. So if you just compel everybody to do it, and just a few accept it and really understand what you're doing, it's worth it to force the rest of them. He goes on, if true reason benevolence demand that we forcibly secure the safety of people for the brief space of their life on earth, then it certainly follows that we should also compel them in order that men may attain eternal life and escape eternal punishment. Hence, the righteous persecution of heretics is nothing less than a work of mercy to which we ought to apply ourselves. He believed that torture was good. Now, he did not believe killing was good. Because if you kill somebody, that's not really helping them. <laughs> you're actually the house is, you're helping the house to collapse on them. So he said, don't kill them, just torture them. Just, just get them to, to, to hurt a little bit. And then, they'll, and then they'll decide to do the right thing. So he said this, heretics imperil their spiritual health. They are destined to suffer the torments of hell. Thus, those who truly love their neighbor will recognize their, and these are his words, duty to compel those wandering sheep. Righteous persecutors are like physicians who try to help a raving madman, for heretics commit murder on their own persons. When motivated by love, persecutors cannot do evil. Love, and you cannot but do well. So he argued this is an act of love, to not give religious freedom to people. You know what's best for them. We know the Bible. Now he was speaking, especially out of the Donatist argument, uh, uh, controversy. There were Donatists in North Africa where he was living, and the Donatists were the ones who had said, because the Roman emperor had said you had to offer sac uh, incense to the, to the Caesar, and the Christians said no. Many Christians said no. That's an act of worship, and that's against the commandment. I'm not going to do that. Some Christians are like, well, God knows my heart, so I can do it. They pay other people to go do it for them or, you know, get the documents uh, or pay off people to do the documents for them. And there was a huge controversy after that persecution went away. And the Donatists, some people said, nope, the Donatists, those who, who, who caved in and, and didn't follow their conscience, they should not be allowed back in the church. And so St. Augustine, this was, it was bred out of this controversy that St. Augustine uh, was writing that these heretics, uh, you know, we, we know what's best and we will do out of love, we will help them. Well, right, a, right after Christianity started following this, guess what happens? Islam, and I put on a map of it because you, know, you know my love for maps. If you read Daniel and Revelation, I, I love maps. And look at what happened to Christianity by the 7th century AD, actually by the 8th by about 750 A.D. So after Christianity started to become more, you know, perse persecuting of other religions, all of a sudden the Islamic Empire rose up. Now, if you look at it in our eyes today, Islam has become more of a persecuting power now, and Christianity has become more of a tolerant, freedom-loving religion. It was just the opposite back then. The Muslims actually would allow non-Muslims to live in the Islamic Empire, and they called them dhimis. And these were any, anybody, Jews, Christians, but especially Jews and Christians, because they were people of the book. So the Muslims came along, and it was the Christians who were especially, they loved to persecute their fellow Christians, because, man, how could they not understand the Bible? We will tell them what to do. So many Christians, guess where they had to go for religious freedom? The Muslim Empire. And they could worship freely in the Islamic Empire. They could have their own legal system. The Jews had their own courts in many places. Uh, as long as they paid the jizya. Now, some Christian historians say, well, that was a bad thing. 
But actually, the Muslims said, hey, instead of you going and fighting in the military, you just pay us, we'll protect you, and you stay at home and don't do anything. I don't know, I think I'd go for that. <laughs> I think I'd pay the tax, let them take care of the empire, and I would stay at home and enjoy my freedom and worship like I want. So that was kind of the thing they had. Now, from time to time, as if you just look at history, uh, religion is a basis of so much persecution. And from time to time, Muslim rulers would come along and they would persecute some of the Jews or Christians or other, uh, actually Zoroastrians. They had Zoroastrians, worshipers of uh, fire there, uh, especially over by Persia. Actually, where I was living, Azerbaijan was the home of Zoroastrianism. Um, anyway, th that's an interesting development. So it's interesting that because the Quran, in the Surah number 2, it says there is no coercion in religion. Now, Muslims haven't always followed that, but early Islam did follow that. More or less, they allowed people uh, to voluntarily enter Islam. And this whole idea we have of Islam spreading by the sword isn't completely uh, verified by historical records. It appears that most of the population converted to Islam over time. And probably because the Muslims were more just and more... Uh, understanding of the local populations and the Christians at that time. The Byzantine Empire was, was not uh, a very caring empire, if you will. Now, I, I couldn't help but to bring this, this one up. I talked to our religious liberty group about it. They weren't so convinced uh, that this was a good uh, example of religious freedom, but you've heard of Genghis Khan. You can look in Western textbooks and, and every bad adjective we have in the English language will be associated with Genghis Khan. But one of the things, and he was a very, could be a very violent uh, individual. But it's interesting, he had almost died as a boy. He was supposed to be the ruler of his tribe. His dad was killed. Uh, the, his tribe ended up not wanting him to be the ruler, so they kicked his mother and his brothers and him out of the tribe, and he was going to die on the Mongolian steppe. His mother kept him alive on this mountain where there was some guru there, the uh, mystic guy that was uh, there. They would eat worms. And I mean, she kept him alive through these severe Mongolian winters without the protection of a tribe. It was a miracle they, they were able to stay alive. Because of that experience, he used to go and talk to God. He believed there was a, kind of almost like a Native American. There was a great spirit, God, that he would talk to all the time. And throughout his whole uh, empire. It became the fourth largest empire ever in the world. And they, they would ride on horses, and there were only one million Mongols, and they conquered 20 million people. Which, by the way, if you look in Western textbooks, why, one reason why we have such a negative view of him is that he would kick out the educated classes and put in Mongols as rulers and just have the local people pay a tax. But one thing he always did was he was very religiously tolerant. And he told his soldiers, never touch a priest, Never touch a uh, shaman or what, uh, what do you call those uh, native religion uh, leaders or an imam or rabbi. And he would, in his tent, he would invite different leaders of religions to come and talk to him. He had all his daughters marry Christians. And they tried to convert him to Christianity. And one of the things he said he just did not like about Christianity was, was he said, you have to talk through a priest to God? I talk to God on the mountain all the time. Why do I have to talk through a priest to God? And so he didn't, never became a Christian, but he liked Christians the most probably out of all the other religions, and that's why he had his children marry them. But he's one of the first people to ever allow not just the nation, because there were, had been some other rulers like Cyrus who had said, okay, your nation can have religious freedom. He actually allowed the individual to have religious freedom, which is very interesting. And by the way, the reason why I know all this was that Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Benjamin Franklin all possessed books in their library about Genghis Khan as far as religious freedom that he gave. And you can look at, there's a book out now, came out a few years ago, uh, Genghis Khan and the Quest for God. Uh, he's one of the first, maybe there were others, that actually um, believed that individuals were equipped by God to choose their religion, which, you know, not looking at his, his other exploits, because when he did conquer, they were, they were very violent. And by the way, if you want to unite all the peoples of the world in that part of the world, talk about Genghis Khan. Every nation where I went hates him, <laughs> because he conquered all of them. Uh, but anyway, and the state did still interfere with religion, 
like the organized religion, they wouldn't let them do everything, but they allowed the individuals to decide which uh, religion they were going to be a part of, and they would not punish them. So we get to religious freedom in Europe, because this is, next week Gary is going to go over religious freedom in America. We won't really understand what, we're, we'll, what we have here unless we kind of understand the context of, of what led to that. So religious freedom in Europe, there was very little of it. You could not say much against the church. In fact, John Wycliffe, he was martyred in 1384. You know why? Because he didn't believe in transubstantiation. That's not a... It's hard to believe that you would think that it's better for someone to die because of somebody doesn't believe that actually the, the wine and the bread actually become the body and blood of Christ. It seems like... A, Common sense would tell us that that's probably the more reasonable of the uh, beliefs, and yet he was burned uh, in England, and uh, his, his followers, which became known as the Lollards, were persecuted. Jan Hus began to preach the Bible in, in the Czech Republic. He was burned at the stake in 1415. 1501, all the Jews were forced to convert to Christianity in Spain and the Muslims, by the way, I didn't put that up. And most of them were chased out and went to the Ottoman Empire. And I remember reading the Sultan saying, what are these Christians doing? They're giving me, he's giving me their best people. They were all the artisans, the hard workers, and all of them came into the Ottoman Empire. Why? You're a different religion. You can't live here. They, they either forced them to convert or had them get out. But right around the 1500s, we see in human history, things started to change a little bit. And there were enough. There was Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, you know, Huss and Wycliffe had kind of led the way. People were starting to question the way things were in the church. Why is the church persecuting people? Why is it so uh, against progress? And all of a sudden, the Reformation begins, and people begin to deal with this issue of religious freedom. Although, if you read about John Calvin... <laughs> He had uh, the preacher Servetus executed in Geneva for um, heresy. Martin Luther also was not the most accepting of other people of different faiths or different beliefs, even in Christianity. There was still this mentality that, okay, now we're Protestants, so all of our German tribes are now Protestant. All of the Swedes are now Protestant. Anybody that goes against that is you know, is bad. So, it was, yeah, they changed their theology, but the mentality, it, it, was, it was very hard to change it in, in Europe. Transylvania, I read about, this is one of the first places, there was the Edict of Torda, and they finally said, okay, because now you've got Catholics and, and Lutherans and different Protestants. You have the, the refor Reformers, uh, the, the Calvinists, the Presbyterians, uh, the Church of England, we'll see here in a little bit. So what do you do with all these groups? And this edict in 1558 said, yeah, well, we need to, um, I'm sorry, did I say prohibited there? I think it, it was permitted. Yeah, Catholicism and Luther, Lutheranism was permitted. Calvinism, though, was still <laughs> prohibited. So they were picking and choosing which ones were, well, this one's good, that one's good, that one's not good. Finally, after 10 years, the freedom was given to all religions in Transylvania, but this was religious tolerance, and they did prohibit some acts that were deemed as dangerous to others, and so the government was still involved in the church in figuring out who is dangerous and who is not dangerous, and for instance, religious minorities, by the way, they talked about the Sabbatarians in Transylvania, and they would not allow them to be in parliament or the diet at the time. Uh, and this was unique for centuries in Europe, to have Catholics and Protestant monarchs ruling in the same territory. Uh, Netherlands was another place where this happened. England, it went back and forth. Six, and it all lasted until about 1638 when guess who got started to be persecuted? Those who observed Seventh-day Sabbath, the Sabbatarians, were persecuted. So if you think, you know, our under, understanding of persecution for Sabbath is, is not a historical or, you know, an unreasonable one, it has happened before. England. I won't even go into all the history of that. I've been reading a book on the history of England. It's, it's just confusing because it goes back and forth like a ping pong ball between Catholicism and the Church of England. And when Henry VII, VIII, who was trying to get a, his wife annulled, uh, wife is marriage annulled by the Pope, uh, he wouldn't do it. So he's like, okay, I'm leaving the church. And so all of, all of a sudden the English Reformation starts. 
Uh, after a while, Bloody Mary comes back to the throne, uh, or comes to the throne, I should say, didn't come back. She begins to persecute Protestants. If you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, this is when that occurred uh, during that time period. Then her sister, or half-sister Elizabeth I, comes to power after she dies of uh, a disease. And then 5058, she returns England to Protestantism, and all of a sudden you have Protestants. And then the whole 1600s is this back and forth. You have the Puritans arising who wanted to purify the church. They said the Church of England didn't go far enough. They, many of them had been, spent time over in Holland, and they had seen how Holland had, they had more religious freedom. They came back to England, and they said, you're not doing enough. And so they were named the Puritans. Uh, they were the dissenters. The Baptists... Just by doing baptism, you were showing that the baptism that the church did when you were a baby wasn't good enough. So you were already deemed like, well, you don't really respect the church. So the, how, how, how do you deal with these people? Do you kick them out? Do you persecute them? Do you kill them? Uh, and it was this back and forth in England of fighting. And it actually led, you can actually go on the, the United Kingdom's parliament page. This is right off their parliament page. I got this today. Strict uniformity of religious worship among the people was a vital political priority during the 17th century. Those who did not support the church were seen by monarchs and their advisors as a threat to the state and to social order. For example, in 1642, in accordance with instructions from the Speaker of the House of Commons, returns were made to Parliament of those who made the protestation to maintain the true Reformed Protestant religion, which was in fact a veiled attack on the king's Anglicanism. Ultimately, religious conflict within Parliament led to the English Civil War. This is right on their secular Parliament page. What was the main reason led to Civil War? You can read about it when Charles II and all the turmoil that England had to go through the Civil War and Ireland and Scotland and the Catholics and the... I mean, it's still going on, so there's some of the conflict over this. It, it was so bad that religious conflict within Parliament led to Civil War. Now... Gary will continue on next week with what happened in America and why it was so special. But this is the context. 1620, the Mayflower comes over here, right during this time, right when England is in the throes of trying to figure out how, how do you deal with dissenters? How do you deal with people that say to the church, you know what, I don't believe in your baptism. I'm going to get baptized again. Sorry. Um... So Puritans, uh, they wanted to purify the Anglican Church of all the Catholic practices. They were very pious. They actually came to power after the Glorious Revolution. And they were actually Calvinists. They adopted this Reformed theology. They wanted to be Presbyterians. And so they were, they, it was all about governance. Who gets to govern the church? And the Presbyterians said, wait a minute, the presbyters, the elders should get to govern and the Anglican Church said, no, the, the king and the, the head of the Church of England are the ones who call the shots. So they were deciding who gets to disfellowship, who gets to determine who the heretics are, who doesn't go with the Bible or against the Bible. And these, all these issues led to, uh, amongst other political issues, I'm not going to say that these were the only issues they were wrestling over, because really their political issues were very similar. Who gets to call the shots? Scotland, Ireland, England... So the church and the state, they kind of mirrored some of these protests as they went to war. Uh, so I found a couple websites that talk about this, how we don't talk about this in America, but how the Netherlands played a role in America because they were going through this 80-year war with Spain, 80 years. Um, and in this turmoil, they had to come to some agreement because it was the Catholics, it was the Protestants, you've got all the Calvinists that are leading uh, the Netherlands and they're trying to make a, a, a nation. And they finally said, okay, we need to have personal freedom of religion. <laughs> and although they had Calvinist leadership. So guess who started coming there? The Jews started to come from around Europe. The Huguenots, the Protestants of France came there. The dissenters we were just talking about in England, they all headed to, to the Netherlands. And so the Netherlands all of a sudden becomes this world power. And how do we know that? Because New York used to be called New Amsterdam. And the Dutch had this huge trading company going all the way over to uh, India and all around the world, Africa, 
and they were, they were trading, and all of a sudden, all these talented people start to come looking for freedom, and all of a sudden, the nation starts to prosper, which is one thing we do see in history. When a nation gives religious freedom, you, see, you start to see prosperity. You start to see people being able to act according to their consciences. And so the Netherlands actually had a place where they could really try, because it was always conflict in, in the Netherlands of, do we have religious freedom or not? So you have New Amsterdam, and all the, like Virginia, for instance, that was a colony made where the Baptists are like, we're going to go convert the Native Americans. We want to do it our ways. We know about the Puritans. They came over. They said, we're going to have a Puritan state. If you don't go to church, you're going to be put in the stocks. You get punished. And in New Amsterdam, they said, wait a minute, we're going to have more toleration. We're going to have uh, religious freedom. And it became one of the biggest, most prosperous cities in the world to this day, New York. I'll, I'll end on this quote, and then if we have any comments. This, this led to people like John Locke, and I just give this as an example of uh, the thinking. The care of souls cannot belong to the civil magistrate because his power consists only in outward force, but true and saving religion consists in the inward persuasion of the mind without which nothing can be acceptable to God. And such is the nature of understanding that it cannot be compelled to the belief of anything by outward force. Confiscation of a state, imprisonment, torments, nothing of that nature can have any such efficacy as to make men change the inward judgment that they have framed of things. John Locke wrote this in England right before we had our American Revolution and before Americans started wrestling with this. Roger Williams. Gary will get into that next week. So there's leading up. Hopefully that's a good lead up to us understanding what was the world looking for? People from around the globe. There, there, there was, I mean, we're talking about very few little places. There was some religious freedom in India from, from time to time. Actually, for the most, most part, Hinduism was pretty good about that. But again, most people just go along with the flow of what their grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather believed. And that's been the story of history, is that when you decide to go against that grain and change your religion, that's something unique. And so to, for human history, would it work? Would it work for a country to say, okay, once and for all, we're going to state that this is a place of religious freedom. And it's interesting. I have a book. Thomas Jefferson owned a Quran as well. He was studying Arabic. And he had dialogue with people. Could a Turk, could a Muslim become president of the United States? And people were really doubting about that. Well, how would that work? You need to, set the, the, you need to have the country be that religion. Can you, can you create a, a nation that is not based on religious persuasion? So we're going to see about that next week. I'm sorry, I went a little bit longer than I thought, but I do want to, if anybody wants to make a comment, we have a mic here uh, or a question. Is it on? Um, is it on? There you go. Yeah, there we go. Fascinating presentation. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that I enjoy about being a Christian is the, I mean, in the Bible, there's this idea of choice. One of the things that we celebrate and God gives us this choice to either follow him or not. And so that uh, lays at the foundation of Christianity and religious freedom. Um, one of the complicated, complicated conversations when it comes to religious freedom is um, how does one's religion, how is it viewed in practice, you know? And, and so with that being said, how does that affect the neighbor, you know, for Christianity, we kind of understand it 
for the most part, most people are illiterate. They don't read the Bible, but um, there is a command to treat each other correctly. And so it seems like there needs to be an education on other religions um, to help people feel comfortable with that other religion or re to respect that other religion in order for that other religion to have the freedom to practice. Yeah. If you kind of understand where yeah. I'm going with that. Yeah. Well, you say, Ned, are you talking about educating other religions in that? Or educating Christians? Everybody. Because really, when, if you think about it, if you, if you think about it, we had about two, three hundred years of freedom in Christianity at the beginning. About 1,500 years where Christians had a hard time giving freedom and didn't want to give freedom. And now about 200 years of... So it's about 500 to 1,500. 25% of the time of the Christianity has been, you know, an expanding worldwide religion. 75% uh, of that time, we, even though you say, and it's true, if you look in the Bible, God gives choice, where the Spirit of the Lord is freedom, there's so many Bible texts, and it, even Christians have a hard time giving religious freedom. It, but yes, you're right. Uh, by the way, I went to some uh, meetings over in Baku. I, you remember, I think some of the Marines or Army guys in, in uh, Iraq, maybe, maybe you're even over there at that time, Rishon, were throwing Qurans in the toilet. You remember that? Anybody remember that? And it came out in news. It was a huge deal in Azerbaijan. They called all the religious confessions together, and they wanted to make an anti-blasphemy law and petition the UN that this, this should be outlawed. No religion should be able to take the other religion's book and toss it in a toilet or, or blaspheme. And... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I had Muslim friends, and they tried to get me to go along with it. But even my Adventist friends that were working in that part of the world, they were like, yeah, yeah, there should be laws against that. I was like, wait a minute. I, I don't go along with that. I mean, somebody should have the freedom to take a Bible, put it on the ground, step on it, burn it, and spit on it in my presence. And I mean, I don't think it's wise. I don't think it's a good thing to do. But I don't think there should be a, a law against it. So anyway, yes, I'd, I've seen that. Any more comments, questions? If not, let's just uh, bow our heads for prayer, and then we'll uh, dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we live in this time period of religious freedom. And Lord, as we look back, we see how how infrequent it happens. So, Lord, we can only thank you that we live in this blessed time. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work on people's hearts, that we will continue to have a blessed time. So we thank you for everything. And as we dismiss, we pray that your Holy Spirit will go with us and may protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Gary Simpson will be here and will present on American Religious Freedom.